So this is not necessarily part of part of our lesson tonight, but this is just a little book. I may have gotten this for 99 cents on Amazon. Uh, this is called Keys to Good Government, and it's a David Barton book. So the wall builders, the guy that we saw last uh, last week on there. I mean, this is wisdom for cheap right here. This is probably 99 cents. I might have gotten it shipped to me for a couple dollars, but just in reading this much of it, I've already been blown away. But just let me read a little bit of this. Um, this is just amazing. So, in the context of separation of church and state, or, you know, where is God in our country, or what kind of foundation did we have? Listen to this. So, we're talking about constitutions and declaration and all that well when the when the founders when when they decided that they were going to break away from from Great Britain they said well we've just abolished our government you know Great Britain we got to create another one so one of the things they did was they went home and they started making state constitutions and a lot of our federal constitution came from uh, bits and pieces and influence from state constitutions so this is David Barton talking about some of those state constitutions and talking about, you know, we've been talking about not only the kind of laws that we want as a country, but also the kind of people that we want representing us, the kind of leaders we should have. And of course, Proverbs says, Proverbs 29.2 says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. And we can't just have a good constitution. You need people who are going to follow the constitution. Because if they are lawless, it doesn't matter what you've written down. They're not going to follow it. So listen to some of the kinds of people that the founders wanted in positions of authority in their state. This is actually from the Delaware Constitution. Now, I don't know if it's still in there, but this is what the founders wrote in their constitution. Every person who shall be chosen. Now, this is a, a legal document here. Every person who shall be chosen a member of either house or appointed any office or place of trust shall make and subscribe the following declaration. I do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. So that, that, was, that was an oath, that was a proclamation they had to make to serve in either house in Delaware or appointed to any office or place of trust. They had to affirm that. That's Christianity. They had to affirm the Bible and the Trinity. The Pennsylvania Constitution declared, And each member of the legislature, before he takes his seat, shall make and subscribe the following declaration. I do believe in one God, the creator and governor of the universe, the rewarder of the good and the punisher of the wicked, and I do acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. That was the Pennsylvania Constitution. Massachusetts likewise. All persons elected must make and subscribe the following declaration. I do declare that I believe the Christian religion and have firm persuasion of its truth. North Carolina, no person who shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Christian religion or the divine authority either of the Old or New Testament or who shall hold religious principles incompatible with freedom and the safety of the state shall be capable of holding any office or place of trust or profit in the civil department within the state. So these are essentially legal documents saying what kind of person shall be allowed or prohibited from holding office in their state. And this is our founding. That's remarkable. It is remarkable. And we just we just saw a little program on I Stand Sunday about someone who uh, is suppressing the Christian vote. I mean, could you could you just imagine the people that said these are the kind of people we want to serve in an office, hearing about an elected official suppressing the Christian vote and subpoenaing subpoenaing pastor's sermons. So this is just some of the the great wisdom and knowledge you can get from David Barton. It's going to be exciting. We're going to talk about solutions, but of course we're learning about America's godly heritage, good economics, and the proper role of government. We've had a great time with snacks, friends, and saving our country. And of course tomorrow's voting day. 
we're going to go and do our civic duty and vote. So solutions. All right, we've been talking about the problems. And of course, if you understand the problems, you probably know what the solutions are. But we're just going to outline some of those so that we're clear. Of course, we've got the fireworks there because it's, it's exciting. We've talked a lot about the problems our country faces. We did that because you have to know what the problems are before you can so know what the solution is. The answer is to undo the problem. See things in reverse. Send things in reverse. Albert Einstein is quoted as saying, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So we can't keep on doing what we've been doing if we want something different. So if we want our country to look different, we have to do something different than what we're doing now. As a country, we've turned our back on God, implemented bad economic policies, and allowed the government to overstep its constitutionally prescribed role. The people have become immoral and ignorant. These are the things we need to fix. That is why we are learning about America's godly heritage, good economics, and the proper role of government, so that after we have learned, we can vote and serve according to those principles. We will be educated, and we will continue to be moral. So let's be specific. What's going on? Crazy taxes, rampant welfare, price controls, costly regu regulations, leech-like unions. We haven't talked a lot about unions, but unions are a problem. Bloated federal budgets, national debt, illegitimate government departments, government overreach, improperly le elected Senate. We haven't talked about that yet. And, of course, an impotent House of Representatives. So let's fix it. Now, who remembers what this is? what graph this was from earlier on in our class. Anyone remember? It's sort of shrunk. So th the problem is people hire lawyers and accountants to figure out their taxes. Some people pay... Oh, tax rate. That's right. On business. That's right. That's right. This is your corporate tax rate and this is just a, a little chart of where we fall. We are the most uh, most expensive country to do business with as far as corporate tax rate goes. Uh, our corporate tax rate is somewhere around 39 percent, highest in the world. So businesses are uncompetitive, <sighs> complicated taxes. Um, it's unfair, really. Fair, when I was growing up, was treating everyone the same. If my mom said we've got two cookies with two people, that means each person got one cookie. Fair today means, well, this person's littler than the other person. That's a big guy, so I'm going to give the little guy two cookies. In other words, fair right now is thrown, up, thrown upside down. But fair, as I was raised, was treating everyone the same. Well, that's not the way we do it today. Um, our tax policy hurts productivity and sense of growth. The solution, make taxes simple. Have a flat tax that everyone pays equally. That's one example. In other words, treat everyone equally. Significantly lower or eliminate corporate income taxes. Okay, so if we want jobs to come back from overseas, we better lower our 39% rate or get rid of it. Just completely get rid of it and watch the money come back over here. Watch the jobs be created because now every business now has that much more money to put into jobs, investment in their own company, etc. Also, you can eliminate capital gains taxes. So this is a tax on investment. Right now, people probably don't want to invest in the stock market for various reasons or other investments with their money because they get taxed on it. So they have an incentive to put it into tax-sheltered investments where it's not really being productive in the economy, but they're not going to get penalized on it right now. So eliminate that capital gains. Allow people to have more of a reason to invest. So these are just some of the ideas that will help our economy grow. We've got rampant welfare. Welfare in America is like a vast empire uh, bigger than the entire budgets of almost every other country in the world. We have approximately 200 plus federal or state programs, including 23 low-income health programs, 27 low-income housing programs, 30 employment and training programs, 34 social services programs, at least 13 food and nutrition programs, and 24 low-income child care programs, among others. And this came from a Forbes.com article. The solution? People need to take care of themselves. They must not be rewarded for inactivity. If people need help, let private individuals and charities provide help. We must reduce and eliminate government welfare. People become productive members of society. People gain dignity and self-confidence from actually working and providing for themselves. The government saves money by not taking care of them. 
price controls. We learned about the minimum wage. The minimum wage, even though it doesn't feel that way, it really does cause and contribute to unemployment. We talked about that. It causes prices to rise and innovation to slow. It distorts the market and reduces freedom. It incentivizes sending work overseas where they don't have those things. This is just a, a picture of the recent uh, protests. People have been saying they want $15 an hour to flip your burgers at McDonald's and other fast food places. That's crazy. It is crazy. The solution, lower or eliminate the minimum wage. It doesn't mean that you can't get paid $15 an hour, you just have to be worth it. So this is not a restriction, it is a freedom. Eliminate every price control in the market. This will cause prices to fall and allow money to be allocated to other destinations. This increases the freedom of employers. It incentivizes bringing work back to the United States from overseas. It also allows young, unskilled individuals to have their first job gain skills, make some money, and move up the ladder as their skills increase. Costly regulations. The problem, government regulations cost money. Jobs, productivity, and time. They are often politically motivated and oppressive. Often, they don't even achieve their stated goals. For example, environmental regulations against the coal industry. Coal equals roughly 40% of America's industry. It's reliable and cheap. The EPA regulations would increase electricity costs and increase prices of goods and services throughout the economy. It would put hundreds of thousands of workers out of productive jobs. All because someone doesn't like this stuff. Because they think fossil fuels are evil. Or do you think it's because they can control electricity? Maybe that too. I mean, they may have multiple motives. Because you get rid of coal, I mean, we're running on electricity here. If they cut me off right now, yeah. we're in the dark. Well, I recently heard um, there's actually the Institute for Energy Research, IER, who talks a lot about this stuff. They're really, really good. But they even talk about the possibility of if you really impose a lot of these regulations like they want to, that we could be exper experiencing brownouts and blackouts. I've heard that. A brownout is simply a kind term of a short-term blackout. Yeah. I actually used to live in the Philippines and we had brownouts. I don't know what was brown about it because the power just went out. Mm -hmm. And every day about the same time all of the generators around town would turn on and you'd hear engines running all day long and then at some time they'd turn the power back on. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's brown about it, the power was just out. Mm -hmm. But in other words, if coal supplies 40% of our energy, we're not getting that from windmills. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they're talking about the real ramifications of him implementing some of these policies. So everyone better go out and buy generators, but hey, that runs on fossil fuels too. Right. So the point is, is that there are costly regulations that at some point really do have very damaging effects on our lives. The solution, eliminate any government regulation that inhibits productivity and hurts people. Allow the free market to solve the problems. For example, this would be most environmental regulations. Get rid of them. Many financial regulations, get rid of them. Barrier to entry licensing requirements for many industries, such as the, the young lady that came from Africa and she was raised uh, actually braiding her sister's hair over there and she came over here and wanted to braid people's hair for a little bit of money and the, the local you know, beauticians and whatnot, well they got upset because they were gonna steal some of her business. They required her to go to beauty school essentially, complete something like a thousand hours of, of training and that was going to cost a lot of money. And then they would license her to braid hair. But the problem was they don't even teach hair braiding at the beauty school. So the point is that there's a lot of barriers to entry that are oftentimes uh, regulations imposed by people who simply don't want competition. So get rid of that stuff. It doesn't mean you don't like clean air. It means you let the states deal with it or... You know, if you're somehow polluting my water or something like that, well, then I can take you to court. But in that case, it's more of a property rights issue than a government overarching regulation. Leech-like unions. We haven't talked about this too much just because of time, but labor unions run up costs in their industry, whether it be GM and the car industry or the healthcare industry, anything. This is harmful in the private sector, but absolutely destructive in the public sector. They demand higher pay, extensive benefits, lavish pensions.
These things hurt businesses in the private in the private sector. In the public sector, they bankrupt cities and run up budgets because they have the taxpayers to draw from. So this is actually a problem across the country in different municipalities, but you've actually had cities go bankrupt because of whether it be pensions or whether it be other you know demands that have been made upon them, but one way or another, it is a big problem. FDR, who is very, very pro-union, actually said you should never have government unions because in a private sector, if you bankrupt a business, at least the buck stops there. Unless, of course, you're too big to fail and we bail you out, which that was horrible. But in the public sector, in a government union, you can just up your budget, which comes from the taxpayer. So essentially, when you have a public sector, a government union, the, uh, the insanity never stops until essentially you're a city that goes bankrupt because you realize that you can't pay for all your promises. Like Detroit. Like Detroit, exactly. So essentially, you need to, well, basically allow businesses to fail when they've had their unions bleed them dry, but possibly even make a government ban on government unions because of the destructive nature they have. But one way or another, you need to be careful of unions. Of course, the solution, allow unions in the private sector, but there must be no government bailout of any company for any reason. They must bear the risk and reward of their decisions. There must be absolutely no public sector unions in the United States. Whether these are made illegal or simply not tolerated, they must not exist. Now this is going to be fun and ridiculous, but let's try and laugh so that we don't cry. Bloated federal budgets. Uh, I was teaching the class to the 11th and 12th graders at school and I remember just this very, very sweet uh, student, you know, she was very concerned and she was new to a lot of this stuff and she just said, well, if we cut the budgets, will they have any money left for the military? And she was so sweet because she just thought all of our tax money just goes to the military or to these, you know, to building roads. And she didn't realize, well, one year we spent, uh, actually every year apparently we spent $25 billion for vacant or unused properties at the federal level. At one point we spent $15 million for the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund. So this is the fish. Awesome. Okay. That's right. Dennis, could you read this next one here, 325? 325,525 for National Institutes for Health to study 82 couples and conclude marriages are happier when wives calm down quickly during arguments. <laughs> no, I didn't pick that because your wife is sitting next to you. But essentially, we spent $300,000 to study spousal arguments. Yeah, study, studied more and figure out really what's going on. James, why don't you read the next one? 1.9 million for lifestyle coaching for the Senate staff, including the benefits of golf. Oh, a good night's sleep. <laughs> That's right. So we spent almost two million dollars telling people they should oh, go to sleep at night. This is All right. Let's see here. Oh, now this one, I, I'll read it because it makes me particularly sad. But we were planning on destroying more than seven billion dollars of equipment uh, rather than selling it or shipping it back home from Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I mean, that actually makes me sad. Laura, why don't you read the next one, please? Okay. A 325,000 grant for the development of Robo, Robo Squirrel, Robo Squirrel. Body Rodent designed to test the interaction between rattlesnakes and squirrels. Yep, so Robo Squirrel. We've actually got a picture of that, I believe. An estimated $70 million uh, loss for producing pennies. In other words, the cost to produce a penny in 2012 was more than two times its actual value. So we, had, so we had deflated the currency so much to where we're actually losing money every penny we print, or we, that we uh, create. Uh, $3.3 million to bail out a failing Alaska tourist boat. $505,000 to promote specialty hair and beauty products for cats and dogs. $97,000 for floating outhouses for Oregon fishermen. Uh, Let's see, Dennis, you won't know what this is, but why don't you read the next one here? The National Science Foundation was given $1.2 million to see if 60 to 77 year olds experienced cognitive improvements after playing World of Warcraft for two hours a day for two weeks. So this is a video game. So they wanted to see if uh, folks got smarter. <laughs> I don't know what they concluded, but they spent a bunch of money figuring it out. Gosh. Uh, Laura, why don't you read the next one, please? $559,681 grant to study impaired metabolism and performance in crustaceans 
exposed to bacteria, shrimp and crabs on a trip now. Remember we watched those yes. videos. So this was, they spent uh, almost $600,000 studying the shrimp. And remember that guy that we watched the video, he was proud of his study. Remember that? Oh, he was very proud of it. He was it. proud of it. So there's an actual picture of Robo Squirrel. That is, and see, yeah, the remo see, the remo see the remote control for World Robo Squirrel. But that's, this is legitimate. This is a thing. There, of course, is shrimp on a treadmill. We, we watched the video. Yeah. Quite entertaining. We were just rooting for the guy. James didn't know if his legs were actually moving on the treadmill or if he was just floating. Mm -hmm. There's the crab on the treadmill. We, we remember that. This is just little. Uh, and you can find more examples, uh, like we said last week, in Senator Tom Coburn's annual waste book. The solution? Stop it. Just stop it. And don't worry to the wonderful, sweet student who was concerned we wouldn't have any money for roads. We'll still have money for roads, even if we cut our bloated federal government. <sighs> the problem, we owe more money than our whole gross domestic product. Our debt, $17.7 .7 trillion, and we're close to 18 now. Uh, who knows, maybe we've surpassed, on November 3rd, 2014, who knows, maybe we've almost surpassed 18 trillion. But our GDP at that point was 16.8 trillion. So we literally owe more than our whole gross domestic product in, in America. We've actually promised to pay more than everything our country owns. Unfunded liabilities, which is, you know, Social Security, uh, Medicare, etc. So things that we've promised at some point in history, in life, $116 trillion. Our total assets in the whole country, $112 trillion. So we've promised to give more than our whole country owns. If we sold everything we have in a huge garage sale, we still wouldn't have enough to pay back with our current situation, that is. The solution, the same thing if you personally were in debt. Reduce spending, increase income if possible, sell assets, operate as minimally as possible. Give Dave Ramsey a call. Cut those credit cards. Cut government programs and departments to constitutionally prescribed functions. So if the Constitution doesn't tell the federal government to do it, Cut it. Cut welfare. Eliminate costly regulations. Eliminate destructive taxes. Don't waste. Sell federal land. Sell unused buildings. Pay it down. Eliminate the debt. The problem. We have so many departments and programs that shouldn't even exist at the federal level. The Constitution has not authorized them or permitted them. These illegitimate departments and programs cost money to operate and detract from the original design for this nation. They also take away freedoms originally assigned to the states and the people. This is going to be really fun. For instance, the Federal Department of Education uh, spent $70 billion in 2013. Now this is actually a chart here. Since 1970, we've actually spent like this. Okay? Through, for K through 12, we spent like this, but look at our performance in reading, math, and science. They've all stayed about the same. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing with the Department of Education? Mm -hmm. Spending $70 billion a year and not getting it. This should be a state issue. The federal government is not in any way authorized to engage uh, in education practices. Cut it. Get rid of them. The solution, shut down these departments and programs that shouldn't even exist. Each one that you shut down frees tax money to pay down the debt. It allows you to lower taxes since you have less to pay for. This allows the states and the people to retain their rights and their freedoms acknowledged by the Constitution. The solution, who gets the cut? How about the EPA? We spent $7.9 billion in them in 2013. Department of Education at the federal level, $70 billion. Agriculture, $156 billion. This is all just for one year, 2013. And agriculture is where the food stamp program is. Yeah, food stamps. Yeah, there you go. Um, energy, $26 billion. Uh, National Labor Relations Board, labor, this is unions, 20, $258 million, 2013. National Endowments for the Arts, what in the world? Uh, $138 million in 2013. Now listen, James, read what that says. What is this department called? National Wild Horse and Burrow Program. That's right. So this is legitimate. There is actually a National Wild Horse and Burrow Program. Donkeys. 
and we spent $71 million on the horse and burrow program in 2013. This is real. You can look that up. This is about horses and donkeys. What is the federal government doing with our tax dollars? We have plenty of money left over for roads and military if we cut. There's lots of it. Okay, government intervention. One word. What is it? Obamacare. Obamacare, exactly. This is actually a picture that I think I took it. If I didn't take it, I was there. This was the Tea Party, the 9-12 rally in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. And that was a guy dressed up as the Grin Reaper saying he was the Obamacare czar. So that is an actual person that dressed up like that. This is a government takeover of one-sixth of our economy, bureaucrats in charge of health care, IRS enforcement of Obamacare, if that isn't scary enough. You may have insurance, but that doesn't mean you've got care. Get rid of it. Get rid of as many barriers to the free market as possible. For instance, re, uh, remove the prohibition on interstate purchasing of health insurance. So right now, each person in the state may have two or three options, maybe even four or five per state, because they prohibit you from buying, if you're in Virginia, you can't buy a California plan or an Oregon plan. Get rid of it. Now that may be a state regulation, but get rid of it. Let's have competition. And if we remember the first and second, third party purchases, remember how when, it's, uh, when you're not buying something for yourself, then you don't care so much about the quality. And when you're not using your own money, you don't care so much. So we talked about Obamacare, how that's, that may be like a fourth or fifth you know, order good, but essentially promote a first party purchase system where you pay for the care directly. Insurance systems create a second party purchase, government insurance creates a third. So promote one where you're paying directly for your stuff. In that case, you're going to care about what you spend and what tests you do, and you eliminate all the things in between. So it, according to the first, second, third party purchase system, we need to get back to a first party purchase system. Improperly elected Senate. This is something that's very, very interesting. The 17th Amendment was actually ratified in 1913. So, who can remember what else we got in 1913? We got two other, let's see, maybe even three other bad things in 1913. Remember who, who what's the mechanism that they pump money in with? Remember that? Uh, Federal Reserve. That's right. 1913 was Federal Reserve. It was also the income tax when they decided to take the money out of our hard-earned wallets, you know, out of our, out of our paychecks. Um, we also got in 1913 the 17th Amendment, and that actually replaced the selection of U.S. Senators by the state legislature with a provision for the direct election of Senators. So essentially, the founders wanted the Senators, you know, U.S. Senate, like, you know, Gillespie and Warner, like we're voting for tomorrow, they wanted those originally to be voted in by the state legislatures. So in other words, Richmond would select who the Senators were. That way, it was another check and balance on, uh, essentially, the federal government with the states. So it was the tension there. But when they got rid of that and made the Senators popularly elected, essentially, they made no difference now between the representatives, which are popularly elected, and the senators. So now we've gotten rid of that check on the federal government to the states. So if we repealed the 17th Amendment, we would fix that. And that would be one step closer to the way the founders wanted it. So, repeal the 17th Amendment. Uh, for instance, Obamacare would likely have not passed um, if this was in place, if the senators were voted by the state legislatures, because the states knew what kind of burden Obamacare was going to be. So if this was in place, if we repealed the 17th Amendment, we probably wouldn't get things like Obamacare in the future. So repeal it. We have an impotent House of Representatives. The problem is the House of Representatives have forgotten its power um, given to it by the Founding Fathers in order to ensure the government followed the desire of the people. Uh, it has not exercised the power of the purse which could stop any government program it did not approve of. So this is really, really cool. The House of Representatives can not only refuse, but they alone can propose the supplies requisite for the support of the government. They, in a word, hold the purse. This is James Madison Federalist Papers 58. So essentially, any government program that the House of Representatives doesn't like, they just don't give it money. And this is completely legitimate. This is the way the founders wanted it. So we could stop Obamacare right now 
if the House of Representatives just exercised that power. So, they need to exercise it. They could also get rid of uh, the APA, uh, bad, you know, a corrupt IRS, corrupt judges, wasteful projects. They could get rid of it if they exercise the power of the purse. You want to do it a certain way. There's a proper timeline to implement this. Henry Hazlitt said that lawmakers must consider the long-term effect and not just the short-term effect of any act or policy. He also said that we must not damage the short-term conditions so badly that we never achieve long-term goals. We must be wise about how we attempt to achieve these long-term goals. So that the proposed timeline is this. Dennis, could you please read one through four? Lower eliminate corporate income taxes, <clears throat> capital gains taxes, and minimum wage laws. Eliminate costly and burdensome regulations upon businesses and individuals. This will allow jobs to be created, innovation, and, in, and invention to flourish, and businesses to thrive. Eliminate illegal federal departments such as Departments of Education, Energy, EPA, Agriculture, etc. Use unused tax dollars to pay down national debt and balance annual budgets. Okay, so essentially there's a process. In other words, if you start with the things that will help create jobs, well then you can do things like pay down the national debt and balance budgets, etc. So eliminate the barriers to making money. And then, let's see, Laura, could you read 5 through 9, please? Lower, flatten, and simplify federal income taxes. Everybody pays something. Once jobs are opening up and the economy is flourishing, give notice that welfare will end on set date. Use unused welfare money to pay down national debt and balance budgets. Stop taking payroll taxes such as Social Security and Medicare. Determine how much is owed each person and begin paying that obligation. And offer Patriots Club reward for citizens forfeiting their SS and Medicare payments. Mm -hmm. That's right, their Social Security. <laughs> so this is just one idea, but essentially you've gotten rid of or lowered your corporate income tax. All right, so that frees up business money. All right, you've gotten rid of these regulations. You've gotten rid of government agencies. All right, you've got all this tax money that we don't have to pay, you know, towards these agencies anymore. You pay down the national debt. You balance budgets, etc. All right, so now job openings are flourishing. People are getting paid more, etc. And then once the job openings are there, then you start to taper people off of their welfare so that they can have a soft landing, so to speak. Not a soft landing on more assistance but a soft landing into a job, you see. And you do this by, of course, getting rid of those things that stop job creation. Of course. Um, now, as far as uh, Social Security, what are you going to do about that? One thing is to do is just stop taking them, okay? Now, people that get it, what you do is, you say, all right, this is how much you owe you. You tally it on up, and you can either give them a check all at once, or you can pay them off over time, but you stop taking it, and everyone who you've ever taken from you start paying it back. That way, you, that way the government will never actually steal your money in that way. That way you don't essentially um, break faith with the people that you said will give it back to you one day. So you simply stop taking it and now you've, all, you've got all this money that isn't going towards the EPA and the Department of Energy and, and you know, all these other things. Use that money to pay it down. You can also offer some sort of reward like a Patriots Club. Someone that says, uh, I've made enough money in my life. I will you know, forfeit my Social Security payment to help our country. And maybe you, you know, you've you got a wall, you know, like, like the veterans, and maybe, maybe you inscribe their name on the wall. These are patriots that sacrificed their own money to help balance our budget, to help put on the debt. But you do something like this to actually um, you know, fulfill the requirements that, that, that you've told someone you're going to give them back their Social Security money one day. Um, but you also say you can forfeit and be a patriot. But these are just examples. These are just options. James, can you read 10 through 14? Sure. Sell all, you, sell all unused federal land buildings and property used revenue from sales to pay down the debt. Continue to look for taxes which can be eliminated or lowered to foster productivity and freedom. Prevent public sector unions from existing in American government. Operate in a lean financial matter. Have strong military intelligence, counterterrorism forces. Secure borders and have more effective and efficient immigration. Okay, so do you know that 
if you cut the country in half and you go west, that almost half of the western United States is owned by the federal government. Uh, yeah. I yeah. didn't know it was that. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's some number like that. It's like 47% or wow. something. But essentially, the federal government has vast lands that are just untouched. And someone may, may live in a town with this huge plot of land there, and they say, well, I could build a shopping mall there, or I could build a subdivision, but you can't touch it. It's federal land. Did you know that roughly 95% of Alaska is federally owned? Yeah. Sell it. Okay, sell it, put it up for bid. I mean, just five acres of land, you know, is expensive. You can get, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, depending on where you are. But sell huge swaths of it, land. You can maybe have requirements, say, you have to be a U.S. citizen, or you have to do this or that, but sell it. Sell it for the highest bidder. I mean, if, if we've got 95% of Alaska, sell it. Pay down the debt. Balance budgets. You've got half of the United States, you know, in the West that's owned by the federal government, sell it. Sell it to the highest bidder. And then guess what? They can produce on it. They can turn it into productive land one way or another. But the point is, is that we, are, we have assets that are being useless right now. It's sort of like if you had 10 cars in your driveway and they're all running cars and you've only got, you know, you can only drive one at a time. Let's just say that you're in debt. Why don't you sell eight of your cars? Have a spare car, but sell eight of them. And pay down your debt. That's kind of like what it's like. It's like we've got hundreds of cars in the driveway that are perfectly fine cars, but they're just sitting there. But meanwhile, we've got creditors breathing down our neck. Mm -hmm. Sell assets. This is a totally normal thing. Secure the border. So this is this is the kind of thing we have to do. So th my point is that this is not some sort of futile exercise. Is that there are real solutions that can be done. We just need people with the political will, with the backbone, to do it. Overall, we want peace through strength abroad and tranquility, tranquility and normalcy at home. Okay, so we want Reagan-esque type foreign policy, peace through strength, and we want normalcy at home. We don't want to be thinking every day, what's our crazy government do to, want to do today? We want to be able to live our lives without intrusion. We don't want to wonder what they're going to do to us. We don't want to wonder uh, what crazy thing someone else is going to do to us either. Some foreign country, some terrorist. We want tranquility. We've got enough problems on our own without our own government bearing down on us. We want to live our lives freely and productively. And that's our God and Country class.